Thank you, Margo. It is an honor to be back at the Women in Data Science Conference. Two years ago, just before the world closed down, due to the pandemic, I was on the career panel. I had closed my remarks, encouraging you all to consider public service, but I had no idea that I'd be jumping back in myself. So I join you today as the Chief Data Scientist of the United States. I'm the second person to hold this title and the first woman. Today I wanted to talk about how essential data science is for an equitable recovery from the pandemic and economic crisis, as well as resilience to future shocks and stressors like climate change. We need robust data flows for a healthy democracy and a thriving, equitable society. I especially want to focus on the intersection between data and the rollout of the bipartisan infrastructure law, with a few concrete ways that those of you here in the US can help. When the sun is shining and the sky is blue, like it is today here at Stanford, it's easy to become complacent with the data we already have. But when a crisis hits, that's when you really need more from your data. You need more frequent, more granular, more detail in your data. In order to address the compounding crises of the pandemic, climate-fueled disasters, and the chronic stressors of inequality and racism, we need data that is timely, broken down by characteristics such as race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, and veteran status, for small geographic areas, and tracked over time. We, we saw brittle data supply chains earlier in the pandemic, with rural communities that had limited internet access having trouble reporting on vaccines administered, which slowed down their receiving of the second batch of doses from the federal government. We also saw where paper processes that might have worked fine during normal times became untenable. For example, I remember seeing a photo of piles of paper death certificates waiting for data entry. One pile for each month. March 2020, April 2020, May 2020, all piled on the desk, increasing in size. Each month of the, of the pandemic had higher and higher piles, but those data weren't digitized and therefore were not informing policy or action in a timely way. But these challenges we are seeing are not new. 15 years ago, I came up to Washington DC in a secondhand suit, still evacuated from New Orleans due to Hurricane Katrina. I came to talk with members of Congress about how New Orleans needed data to chart a path toward an equitable recovery from the storm. We didn't have enough intel to know where to stand up temporary clinics, which parks to rehabilitate first, and with 80% of the childcare centers shuttered, where should we be prioritizing philanthropic dollars in that sector? We reviewed the data on electricity hookups, water usage, and traffic patterns. We even looked at images from outer space showing nighttime lights. It turned out that the best way to see how many people were back in New Orleans and wherever they were living was to get monthly updates from a direct mail marketing company. You know how it is, junk mail always finds you. A company that rents out those mailing lists had the best data on occupied households. Fortunately for us, somebody in that company had the foresight to archive their New Orleans mailing list for July 2005, the month before the storm. They ended up donating their company's data to the nonprofit data intermediary that I co-led. And because they gave us the pre-Katrina baseline, we could track what percentage of households had returned and keep it updated every month. That data was a game changer for the recovery. Neighborhood associations like the Lower Ninth Ward, which was one of the hardest, pit, hard, hardest hit parts of town, no longer had to use their spring break volunteers to collect data. They could put them to work directly fixing houses. Even the police department used the junk mail data as the denominator for their crime rates for a spell. As we look at the future of data and how we will use data to better serve the American people, we're gonna need to get creative. Private sector data, like we used 15 years ago in New Orleans, will certainly be a part of the equation. So will more robust state, local, tribal, and territorial data. 
The bipartisan infrastructure law is creating opportunities to responsibly collect more data to help our society understand how and whether our systems are serving Americans equitably. It's easy to imagine incorporating data capabilities into these investments, like GPS and internet-enabled electric buses that can increase the predictability of the, of the public transit system for riders and also their productivity while they're riding the bus. Sensors on capped oil wells and to detect leaks and participatory science to monitor water quality. As these historic investments roll out across America, one effort to watch is the Equitable Data Working Group. It was formed from President Biden's executive order on advancing racial equity. This group is tasked with identifying the inadequacies in our existing federal data collection infrastructure and laying out a strategy for improving data practices in the federal government. Across the federal government as we speak, agencies are looking for data gaps that stand in the way of, how, of, they, of assessing how equitable their policies, programs, and services are so that they can improve them. When I see what's happening at the federal level on data and equity right now, it reminds me of the incredible impact that President Obama's Open Government Directive had on me um, and other open data advocates when I was working at the local level a decade ago. When we saw the transformation that was happening at the federal level, we realized that we shouldn't have to beg our own local government for data on building permits or recovery investments. Publishing that data should just be a part of being a modern local government. So we pitched then candidate for mayor, Mitch Landrieu, on the idea, and um, as happens with these types of things, within a year I was inside City Hall working to release the data from the inside. When he took office in 2010, Mayor Landrieu committed to reducing the number of blighted, storm-damaged properties by 10,000. Data management was critical at every step of that process. Code enforcement officers collected inspection findings on sites throughout the city, and we had to shift that process from one that involved yellow pads of paper and envelopes full of photographs to a centralized electronic system that allowed for uploading the data in the field. We had to integrate timely, geographically accurate data from demolition crews, the courts, and state recovery offices. And there had to be easy ways for citizens to report problem properties or check on the status of their remediation. We knew that meeting our goal of 10,000 properties remediated was going to take the entire community. This was a problem bigger than government could fix alone. So we brought in a team from Code for America, the nonprofit, to help us organize all of the data we had about blighted properties into a single source of truth, a website where anyone could enter in an address and see where it was in the process of being fixed. I remember the first public meeting after we released this tool. City Council was holding a hearing on the blight problem, and it was standing room only. A woman walked up to the podium for her three minutes to speak, and she talked about the house next door, how it was threatening to fall over on top of her house, and it was home to all sorts of vermin and criminal activity. She gave the address and pulled out a piece of paper. It was a printout from our new website. As she spoke, the city's blight czar looked up the address on his iPad, and city council staffers pulled it all up on, on their laptops. For the first time since the storm, everyone had access to the same information at the same time. Instead of arguing about what the facts were, the conversation focused on what the solution should be. It was still a hard conversation, but it was much more productive and thanks to that common base of information, we were able to blow past that goal of 10,000 properties ahead of schedule. That digital transformation that occurred in the city of New Orleans a decade ago, that type of transformation is going to need to occur in communities all across the nation in order to meet the challenges we are facing, such as recovery from the pandemic and the economic crisis, 
preparing for and heading off the worst impacts of climate change, and ensuring equitable access to resources and opportunities like those that are found in the infrastructure law. These infrastructure projects will require state, local, tribal, and territorial governments to have the talent and the resources to design these local projects in collaboration with community stakeholders and then deliver. Data capacity will be a key enabler, just as it was in New Orleans working on the blight problem. That means we need people like you at the table. And the first step for communities is awareness about these programs. The law is vast. There's $550 billion in new funding over five years, with, th with 375 distinct programs from high-speed internet to creating reliable public transit to replacing lead pipes. These investments are being rolled out with the priorities of equitable delivery, creating good jobs, using materials made in America, making sure what we build will stand up to a changing climate, and delivering these investments where they are most needed. A few weeks ago, we at the White House released a guidebook at build.gov, that's B-U-I-L-D.gov, that covers each of these programs, along with a spreadsheet for easy sorting. This is just the first version, and we'll be updating it with new information and additional data as it becomes available. For this crowd, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that spreadsheet of programs. We know that the highest capacity jurisdictions already have consultants who have been combing through the law, identifying programs they should get ready for, and, um, and then apply for them. Those communities that need these investments the most, though, they don't necessarily have high-paid consultants. There's room for what you might call a translation layer to curate the programs that are most relevant for different types of communities. Which programs bundle together in a way where the sum is greater than the parts? Like laying fiber while you're expanding the highways, or putting solar farms on remediated abandoned mines. A small town that desperately needs a bridge or high-speed internet to keep their residents connected will often have a part-time mayor who is not single-handedly going to have the time or expertise to identify which programs to apply for and then make the case in a grant. So that's where all of you come in. If you work for a university, think about how you can scrub in. Could your computer science department help cities predict where to dig the lead for the lead pipes or help locate your state's most dangerous abandoned mines? Can you help your community apply the most current climate science to ensuring that any designs for bridges and stormwater management will stand up to future climate conditions. If you work for a nonprofit, how might you use the spreadsheet at build.gov to help your constituents to find the programs that their communities most need? If you work for a company, think about what data you might be able to put responsibly towards solving a challenge in our society. Have the foresight of that person at the junk mail company who set aside the pre-Katrina mailing list. If you're a data scientist, and I use that term in the broadest sense possible, um, please consider joining us in federal government. If you're early career, check out the US Digital Corps as a way to serve your country. If you're further along, consider a tour of duty in the US Digital Service, 18F, or as a Presidential Innovation Fellow. And keep an eye out for good government jobs. You can find most of them at usajobs.gov. State and local governments will also be hiring data and tech people to support these infrastructure projects. And I do want to warn you that those job titles are sometimes boring and they don't reflect how exciting the work is. <laughs> um, and if you're already working in state or local government and want to talk about infrastructure data, please grab me this evening, um, or if you're in person, or reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Thank you.